So tell us, if you would, what Institute has been doing uh, related to post hurricane relief uh, with Irma and. Sure. Uh, well, primarily, we're just making ourselves available. Um, we've got a lot of capacities, we've got a lot of experience operating unmanned systems, and you know, everybody in the community knows the unique value propositions that an unmanned aerial system can provide for collecting data. So we effectively deployed our teams. Um, you know, nobody called us to do it, we, we just went and did it. Made ourselves available, um, liaised with the incident commanders, the emergency responders, educated them as to what we had to offer, how we would go about integrating with our operations, and then and then the next step from there was discussions with FAA to the establishment of TFR so that we could go actually operate the unmanned aerial vehicle because, as you know, Brett, like our airplanes, we don't fly below 500 feet. We actually fly quite a bit above 500 feet, typically between two and 3,000 feet AGL. Um, kind of sensors that we can carry can produce incredible resolution information, but as well as capture different modalities of imagery so we can get thermal imagery at night for fire support. Um, we can get EO imagery during the day uh, for normal, you know, disaster kind of response activities, whether it is trying to find survivors, whether it's evaluating uh, clear passage areas or identifying damage um, and, and helping other companies assess that damage or municipalities and, and port authorities. So we went down, uh, worked with emergency responders, uh, worked with the FAA, who has been amazing in supporting these efforts across the board, not just with us, but with the entire community, uh, to the point that we were really able to get unmanned systems up and operating and delivering decision critical information uh, to the responders as quickly as possible. So you were flying in the wake of both Irma and Harvey? Uh, primarily Harvey. Uh, we were stationed uh, at our office in Starkville, Mississippi, in anticipation of, of Irma needs. Um, fortunately, they, there wasn't as significant a need uh, for Irma, uh, for our capabilities. I think they're giving a lot of coverage to, with just the Group 1 assets. Um, so that team is now home, safe and sound, uh, which is the timing couldn't have been better because also over the last uh, week we've been supporting the Eagle Creek Fire uh, in Oregon, which is very close to our home. Yeah, so that's... Uh, yeah, so having the extra resources around... Is, is, it is very personal, but it's also useful to have the whole team on deck so we can we can shuttle crews a little more effectively, give some people some rest, because people have been, forgive the pun, it's a terrible pun, but they've really been burning the candle at both ends to try to support it. And you, you mentioned, so what is the extra thing that you're, the sort of secret sauce you're bringing here, uh, being able to fly at night over the fire? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the advantages of, of a UAS is, um, you know, it's a semi-autonomous platform. We tell it where to go and it flies it flawlessly. So we know where it's going to be, we know where all the terrain and the obstructions are, so we can safely aviate that environment. And yes, that means we can do it at night. Uh, and because we're not flying, looking out the window, we're effectively an IMC platform, that means we can fly at night and in the smoke and haze and things like that. I think the second thing is the payload that we can carry. Uh, we can carry a thermal and IR payload so that we can see fire line through the smoke and haze and then deliver that fire line information to the incident commander. But those are the technology things. I mean, I think really what we've learned and what the community has learned over the last few weeks from integrating UAS is it's the way you do it. You know, the, the community likes to use the word CONOPS, concepts of operations, but it's really the workflows and the things that you do to be a professional aviator, um, to make sure that safety is first when it comes to deploying these kinds of assets so that you reduce the risk, you maximize the effectiveness, uh, and it's the, it's the coupling of the technology and the way you go about deploying it that make all the difference in the world and enabled us to go support these customers uh, over the last few weeks. So what were sort of the, the products that you were able to provide to the incident commanders? Yeah, uh, in some cases it's, it's live geospatial video. Uh, and I'm very specific about saying geospatial because it's not just a, a video file, which has its use. Um, it's live and it's geospatial, meaning we're taking the telemetry data and we're muxing that into the video stream so that on the cell phone of an incident commander or a first responder who's actually deployed, they can see not just the imagery, but they can see exactly where that imagery on the earth so they can geolocate themselves, reference to that data, and that just gives them a more complete situational awareness picture. So that's kind of the live support. Um, as we bring that data back to the ground control station, we have a number of different workflows depending on the decision product that a customer really needs. Um, for the incident commanders on the fire, what they care about is what's the fire line doing? How's it propagating? 
Um, how does that sit on a geospatial map? Where are sensitive areas that we need to protect? Um, so we're delivering that through our partnership with Esri uh, and a, another company called Fire What, who are subject matter experts, and they built on top of the Esri platform a fire line production capability. So we feed them with our data directly with geospatial accuracy. They then produce the, the, the maps uh, and give that to the incident commanders for them to go do their job. I mean, they're the guys doing the hard job. They're fighting the fire. Uh, and we're just trying to give them as much information as possible. And what was your relationship, your working relationship, I guess, with the FAA during uh, both of these? Uh, very close. I mean, we're on the phone regularly, I mean, hourly with our FAA counterparts to make sure that the right airspace is in place. Uh, we keep each other aware of other participants in the airspace, whether they're cooperative or non-cooperative. Um, we've experienced events of non-cooperative aircraft penetrating flight restriction airspace for in the Hurricane Harvey instance. Uh, we're able to deconflict with that, work closely with the FAA to identify that and steer other uh, unmanned and manned traffic away from the area of the, of the uncooperative participant. So I, I would say it's been a remarkable collaboration uh, with the FAA through these incidents. Would you say this is kind of the, the way of the future that we're going to see in the wake of these disasters, this kind of operation? Yeah, I mean, hard to say. It, it probably won't look the same way it did. Um, I think everybody in the community has learned a lot from the last few weeks. Uh, and I, I think certainly we have learned a lot, and it's given us some ideas as to how we can better incorporate concepts of operation, concepts of deployment, the specific technologies that we need to invest in, um, certainly to support the emergency res response case, uh, but even the larger commercial business case, right? What, what really matters in terms of getting on site and getting sensors uh, over the area that you care about? Um, those things are going to be incorporated into our investment planning and our development things. And I would imagine that for the other agencies involved, they're going through similar cycles where they're, they're really learning um, some great lessons about how this worked. Uh, and frankly, I, I really haven't heard much of how it didn't work. I've, I've heard nothing but really good news about how unmanned systems are now being deployed uh, in this kind of context. How many flights do you think you were able to... Shoot, accomplish? I'm sorry, I don't have that number <laughs> off the top of my head, but... Um, it added to more than we can say, one million total. Right? Yeah, we can say easily, you know, scores of hours flown. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many sorties that is over what amount of time, but teams were flying pretty much all the time. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for doing yeah, that. Yeah, great, no problem. Thanks, bro.